We took it all. We brought them to our land. An endless night. Ember hot and icy cold. The rage of the earth. We made this curse. Carved it in the blood on our backs. We did not see. We could not, but she did. And in the end... What will I become? Senwa Saga. Hellblade 2. Play it now with Game Pass. You're listening to Away With Words, the show about language and how we use it. I'm Grant Barrett. And I'm Martha Barnett. Grant, you and I are fans of proverbs. Oh, yes. And I have a particular fondness for a type of proverb known as an eponymous law. That's a jokey way of packaging a pithy observation and naming it after somebody, either real or fictional. And, of course, I guess the most famous is Murphy's Law. Right, right, which goes... Uh, uh, If a thing can go wrong, it probably will. Exactly. And then there's Muffrey's Law. (laughs) Muffrey's. <laughs> Muffrey's law is when you try to make a correction to somebody else and then make a mistake yourself. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's misspelled, right? Yes. And there's something about attributing it to somebody and making it like a scientific law mm-hmm. that, that makes it a little funnier. Well, is it the mixed registers here? Because the content is a joke, but the name sounds so formal. Exactly. They're all kind of wry like mm-hmm. that. And I was trying to think, well, what would Barnett's law be? Oh, no. I don't yeah. know. Well, I was thinking about it on the way to the studio, and then, then I was thinking maybe Barnett's Barnett's law is uh, the lane you just got out of is the one that's going to move (laughs) faster. (laughs) I was going to say, no matter, Barnett's law is no matter what time you leave, you still get there at the same time. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that's What would Barrett's law be? I don't have one. (laughs) mm, Oh, you have lots of laws. I just, mm, it's hard to boil it down, though. What would Uh, Barrett's law be? Well, the one I tell my son, which is in in fewer words, or coarser words than this, is don't mess with things. That's my <laughs> law because you'll inevitably mess them up. It's kind of like leave well enough alone, basically. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's good using the word mess. He, he's the kid that will push the button that should not be pushed. You know, <laughs> he's a Barrett. What can you say, right? <laughs> well, we'd love to hear your own particular eponymous law. Call us with it. The number is 877-929-9673 or send it an email to words at waywardradio.org. Share your wisdom with us. Hello, you have a way with words. Hi, this is Jim Stewart in Dallas, Texas. Hi, Jim. Welcome to the show. How can we help you? Great, thank you. Well, I've noticed that a particular type uh, of human communication is uh, disappearing. And I uh, wonder what you think about it. Specifically... Uh, graffiti writing on restroom walls is not nearly as prevalent as it once was. I, uh, I'm out and about all day in my, in my car, office buildings. I go to gas stations, warehouses, department stores. And um, I, I noticed not long ago that um, the restroom walls were clean in this particular facility, and it was a gas station where it's usually it's a prime target for graffitiists. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I would started doing a little bit more scholarly research and paying attention and I see that um, there's very little uh, writing on restroom walls anymore, not nearly as prevalent as it was just a few years ago. How interesting. And I'm wondering what you think about that. I think you need to go to a lower class of joints. <laughs> <laughs> well, I otherwise have a life. <laughs> <laughs> That's a fascinating point. You know, I have not seen much either. And in fact, um, I went into a restroom... Uh, at a restaurant recently, and and they had chalk on on the walls, so specifically so people could put graffiti on there. And I remember being kind of jarred by that because I don't see it anymore. Yeah, maybe it's a trend. I, it's certainly I don't I don't know if it's a lost American art form, but mm. I don't know I don't know if we can cry about this very much. <laughs> <laughs> I don't I don't know, but but uh, uh, Jim, do you think that people are finding uh, different outlets through social media well, or something? My- my theory is uh, social media is taking the place of uh, that particular form of communication. If you look at social media, it's the same basic, uh, mostly the same basic uh, uh, types of, uh, of uh, communication that you see on restroom walls. Specifically, the most prevalent topics are religion, sex, and politics. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and you see that a lot on Twitter and Facebook. And some people <laughs> are not very discreet about it either. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's not nearly as anonymous as it as it would be if you're communicating on a restroom wall. But uh, mm-hmm. I think the topics are basically the same. That's a good theory. Yes. I don't know how we'd ever prove that, but it is a really good theory. We now have yeah. a place to release all the 
little goofy things that we'd otherwise, or angry things that we'd write on a bathroom wall. Yeah, yeah, just a way of saying, I was here, look at me. And and I think the other thing, too, is, I mean, not that I made a practice of writing on, on bathroom walls, but... Um, I send a lot of texts from bathroom <laughs> stalls. Many people do. Don't That's you? Right. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you're a constant companion there, right? I mean, you, well, I don't know about constant you, companion. How many times have but... you gone to the restroom and realized yeah. you didn't have your phone and yeah. went to get it before you did your business? <laughs> This is yeah. the way we live now. Yeah, I think it's... I well, think this it's... is not something I plan on... I don't plan on doing a really uh, exhaustive research <laughs> on this. <but> okay. <laughs> well, if you want... I have asked other people. Yeah. If you do want to do a, a read exhaustive research on this... Yes. Jim, there's a, a book written by Alan Walker Reed. It was originally published in Paris in the 1930s mm. because American publishers wouldn't touch it. Alan Walker Reed was a great lexicographer. He traveled around the country and recorded the graffiti. He wrote it down and made a study of it. It was eventually published in the U.S. called under the title of Classic American Graffiti. And if you look for that name, Classic American Graffiti, you'll likely come up with the book. It is an astonishing read. One of the most amazing things about it is how consistent graffiti has been over the years. Even though there's not as much in the restroom stalls as there used to be, you will still find some of the same poetry. Wow, I thought I was the only one that had too much time on my hands. <laughs> <laughs> well, you give an academic a grant and some spare time, and they'll study just about anything. Well, somebody needs to do gonna, a modern I'm day. I'm going to pick that up. Yeah, we need a new one now in the age of social oh, media. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that's what we're looking at. I think certain parts of sites like Reddit and FARC and mm -hmm. some of these Facebook groups, these mm -hmm. are kind of the – this yeah. is the yeah. place where we share the goofy stuff. We we write the little doggerel in mm -hmm. order to entertain others, right? Well, you get a much bigger audience. And I think the repetition that we see there is almost identical to what happened in the bathrooms as well. Like you would go into bathroom and bathroom after bathroom and see the same, the same little one. rhymes, the mm -hmm. same little jokes. Mm -hmm. When I was growing up as a kid, my father worked on a train station and there was an Air Force base there, and there were people from all over the world that would come through there, and the, even the language on the stalls, was some of it was in foreign languages. Wow. <laughs> you oh, really? know, that was a significant part of my early education is uh, uh, reading things on restroom walls that I had no clue that uh, existed in the world. Well, Jim, I think we need you to continue well, collecting data for us. Well, okay, I'm your man. Okay. I'll, I'll let you know what I find. Yeah, please do. Just <laughs> post it on Facebook, on our Facebook page. Well, thanks for calling. Bye-bye. Okay. Great. Thank you. Bye-bye. We'd love to hear your thoughts about the graffiti. It's not the big murals that people are painting. We're talking about the stuff on bathroom walls, the little messages to others, not the crude things, but the funny things, the jokey things, the memorable things. 877-929-9673 or email words at waywardradio.org. Grant, we were talking earlier about eponymous laws, and one that I really like is the one from Cyril Northcutt Parkinson, Parkinson's Law, which is work expands so as to fill the time available for its completion. Yeah, and the corollary, which is your stuff expands and contracts to fill the space available too, right? Oh, yeah, your stuff, <laughs> your, your, stuff, your yeah. personal possessions. You can have like a wallet and it will just like suddenly fill a room. I don't know how that works. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you meant the stock Sanford corollary to uh -huh. Parkinson's Law, which is if you wait until the last minute, it only takes a minute to do. <laughs> that is true. I can vouch for that one. <laughs> I think you found your life's T-shirt. <laughs> Outstanding. We know there's a bunch of these out there, these eponymous laws. Google it. What the heck? And share your favors with us, 877-929-9673, or send them to us in email, words at waywardradio.org. Hello. You have a way with words. Hi. Uh, my name is Elise. I'm calling from Dallas, Texas. Welcome, Elise. What can we help you with? Well, okay. I have an interesting situation. So I'm a school teacher. I teach seventh grade, and this is my first time in Dallas. I used to live in Los Angeles. And I noticed my kids over here were starting to say this word, and I didn't know what the word was. The word was Sina, S-I-N-N-A. And I noticed they would especially use it with each other, or if they wrote each other notes, they would say this word Sina. And um, I didn't know what it was. They would say, Sina, go to the store, or Sina, hang out with my friend. And then I started realizing that it was actually... Um, a slang term for six and two. Mm -hmm. And I, I thought that was so interesting because we don't say six and two in California. We say I'm going to or I'm gonna 
go to the store. <laughs> and I, I, so I started seeing the connection there between Stina was a, a Southern thing and Gunna was maybe a non-Southern thing. That's what I wanted to ask you guys about. Yeah, I think the, the Southerners also say Gunna. But yeah, okay. so finna as a really tight condensation of fixing to is very standard mm-hmm. in the American South and Gulf states also appears in African American vernacular English throughout the United States. And through hip hop, finna is actually transmitted to the larger culture. And so you'll actually find it in the language of people who have no historical connection to African Americans oh. or to the American South. Really and interesting. interesting. But it does follow the same pattern as going to and want mm-hmm. to. I want to go to the oh. store. So wanna right. instead of want to. And the rarer one, which is trying to. I'm trying to fix China. this. Uh-huh. China. I'm trying to fix China. this. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah. those those are the four like big boys in China kind of being the, the left out one there. But yeah, so this oh, is a really gotcha. common kind of colloquial way of speaking. Good on you for having the ear to sense the regional differences there and not come out <laughs> heavy handed to judge them harshly. Well, that's at first I started telling them, don't say that. Like, speak properly, you know? <laughs> and then I thought, if it's a colloquial thing, if it's a slang thing, who am I to correct their, you know, mannerisms, I guess? <laughs> yeah, if they're mm-hmm. standing in front of the classroom giving a presentation, that's when they need to bring out the fixing to, <laughs> right. not the finna. But yeah, <laughs> just talking to their pals, okay. that's a different story. The Dictionary of American Regional English, that amazing work at daredictionary.com, traces back fixing to, not the finna form, to the 1930s, and I'm sure it's much older than that, and probably okay. came into the United States through the Scots. Irish heritage. Interesting. Very, very interesting. Well, thank you for that information. Yeah, sure thing, sure. Elise. Thank you for calling. And good luck with the kids. Oh. You're doing you're doing the best work out there. Teachers are our thank people. You. I appreciate that very much. Thank you. All right, bye-bye. Thank you. All right. Nice to talk to you. Bye. Okay. Bye-bye. What word has caught your ear? Give us a call about it. 877-929-9673. Or you can send it to us in email. That address is words at waywardradio.org. Or find us on Facebook and Twitter. Grant, I bet you haven't heard of this eponymous law. Maybe not. This is Cole's. Cole's law? Mm-hmm. Let me hear it. Thinly sliced cabbage. Yes, 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 <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> That's terrible. <laughs> you liked it. <laughs> <clears throat> Was that laughter I heard yes, over there? Yes, it was laughter, because you seem to be enjoying yourself, and it's effect- That's infectious. It. <laughs> okay, great. Send your terrible puns to Martha at Martha That's at right. waywardradio.org. Thank you. You can also tweet Martha at Martha Barnett. <laughs> And call us with your language questions and observations, 877-929-9673. What's the word you find most savory? Come on, you can tell us. More from Away With Words in just a minute. with Game Pass. You're listening to Away With Words, the show about language and how we use it. I'm Martha Barnett. And I'm Grant Barrett, and are joined once again by our quiz guy, John Chinesky. Hello, John. Hello, Grant. Hello, John, Martha. John, behold. You've made some quizzes for us, I hope. I have. I have one for you right here. You know, I was going through some old day planners of mine, mm-hmm. and of course, um, being a puzzle guy, the notes are kind of cryptic. Mm. If you add an abbreviation for a day of the week to one of the words in one of my memos, mm-hmm. you get a word related to the activity. That's, that's how I keep track of things. Oh, okay. <laughs> I think we yeah. can do for this. For example. For example. What days did I do the following things? Let's try this oh, one. Oh, okay. All right. What a lovely ceremony, lovely couple. Too bad my car got a little ding in the car. <laughs> Wednesday. Yeah, that was on Wednesday. It was a wed ding. Yeah. Thank you. Very good. 
at feeding time, I accidentally locked myself in with the baboons. Luckily, my supervisor had his keys on hand. Whew. <laughs> <laughs> um, what? Monkey. Monkey oh, or monkey. monkeys. Yes, the baboons. Let's try this one. After a long day at the textile shop, it was a relief just to get in bed between some silky soft sheets. Satin. Satin. Saturday. Satin, yes. Very good. Saturday. Nice. Do you know what? Let's move on to the months. <laughs> oh, no. I, you know, okay. I started getting so busy I couldn't make daily entries, so I started writing once a month. <laughs> Add an abbreviation for a month to the fr- beginning of a word in the clue to get a related word. Here we go. It's taken me weeks to perfect my greatest orchestral work ever, but this grand opus is fated to only be the theme music for a documentary on marine life. Marine life. Octopus something. Oh, octopus? No. But... Octopus, yes. Oct- opus. How about this? I convinced my shy, gawky Aunt Ella to join me on a camping trip. Too bad for us both that the campground turned out to be something of a swamp. Marsh. Marshy. Yeah. Marshy. Marsh, yes. Very Mar- good. Shy. Nicely oh. done. <laughs> I was fixated on Ella. Okay. I know. And that, that mm, well, tricky. well keep, keep thinking of that. Keep thinking of that. Because the governor of Alaska has been courting my shy Aunt Ella for weeks now. He sent her flowers, candy, and eau de toilette. Oh, Juno. Yes, oh. Juno. Very good. All of our Alaska listeners are going, Doi! Doi. Doi. I spent the last month carefully copy editing a short book for my shy Aunt Ella, the writer. <laughs> what month was it? Um, novella. November. Yes, yeah. it was November for the novella. Nicely done, Martha. Thank you. Finally, now that my shy Aunt Ella is gone, having the book she dedicated to me has certainly eased the pain of losing her. Deceased December. Yes, Uh, deceased December. Nicely done. So that's all we're going to go through my calendar. I'm going to just get rid of this calendar right here. I'm going to... That's it. I don't need these these notes anymore. But you guys did fantastic. Nice work. Thanks, John. (laughs) I really appreciate it. We'll talk to you next week. Talk to you then. Well, we're talking about words here today, and if you want to ask us about any word, call us, 877-929-9673, or send your questions in email to words at waywordradio.org. Hello, you have a way with words. Hello, this is Josh from Belgrade, Montana. Hi, Josh. Welcome to the program. What's going on? Well, so I have a question about an ongoing dispute with my between my fiancé Liz and I about the way that I pronounce the possessive form of her name, Liz. For example, I would say, when referring to her job, Liz Job, or her car, Liz Car. Um, I also have a nephew, Alex. I do the same thing, where I say, Alex School, or Alex Fish. And to her, this just sounds dumb. It's as if I was saying, Grant Car, or Josh Car. Because you can't um, hear the possessive in there? Yep, it's a possessive, and I... Yep, it'd be, she thinks I should pronounce this Liz's job or Liz's car. Okay. And I think for me where this derives from is the written form where I would write that uh, Liz apostrophe. And that comes from the way that words or names ending in S, you can, some styles dictate that you can just use an apostrophe, others an apostrophe S. So for me, I use just the apostrophe. And when I pronounce it, I just say Liz car. Okay. So the question is, is he right? Am I right? Are we both somewhat right? Is there a gray area? And you've done this all your life then. Did people tell you? Apparently. It was never brought to my attention until she had a problem with it. I bet bet you haven't done it your whole life. I bet you learned Mm -hmm. it from books. I bet up until the point when you had somebody point out to you that the apostrophe appeared after the S, after some words that you Mm -hmm. said... Alex's and Liz's, Liz's mm-hmm. car, Alex's school. I'm betting mm-hmm. that you taught yourself because it seemed like the right thing to do. I'm guessing that's correct, yeah. But we've done some internet research on this, and it's kind of a split decision about, about how to do this. Well, how, mm. how do you define split? You know, you can have a split where there's 50% on each side, and you can have a split mm-hmm. where there's 10% on one side and 90% on the other. 
I, I'd say the latter is more more accurate. Uh, the internet likes her 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 method better. Well, yeah, and Josh, I would like to ask you a few questions about guests arriving at your wedding mm. and people arriving at your wedding. So, would, sure. if you're talking about the arrival of Liz at your wedding, you would say mm-hmm. Liz arrival at my wedding. Boy, that's a good one. I think I would actually say Liz's arrival at the wedding. Liz's arrival. And what about I Prince think Charles? I would, yeah. Well, that's another one. We have we have a few examples here. Yeah, okay. Prince, Let's hear them. Well, so, yeah, be Prince Charles' arrival. We also, she thinks Charles, to say Charles' car or Charles' school is acceptable. Same with names like James or Mercedes. Mercedes school, Mercedes basketball, mm-hmm. that doesn't bother Liz. Mm-hmm. But for names like Elvis or Alex or Angus, you can't say Elvis song. So um, there are just these idiosyncrasies that we kind of agree on even. Oh, that's interesting. And it sounds like maybe mm-hmm. part of it has to do with the second word. Like yeah, we, maybe. We we don't really know. <laughs> like you might say Elvis's house, but Elvis song. Yeah, maybe. Here's another path on this. Most people regardless of what they write, say Liz's and Alex's school. Most mm-hmm. people. Even okay. people who hyper-correct, to leave out the "s" sound at the end of those words, mm-hmm. in times when they're not being conscious of their own speech, still say Liz's and Alex's. So there's no completely right answer here. And I know we're going to get emails from people going, well, ah, Mrs. Frobisher in the third grade told me, well, you <laughs> know, know what? There are people who've examined large data sets to look at people's speech and writing habits. And we know for certain that most people say Liz's and Alex's and have over the okay. course of history. And write it mm-hmm. that way, too. Yes. It wasn't until okay. we became a very, at least the, in the Anglosphere, became a very literate and people started looking really closely at the written language did they try to really make the spoken language conform a lot more to what they were writing. Mm -hmm. And that's often a mistake. And then there's so many exceptions on top of that. I mean, I mean, it's sort of an Achilles heel, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. All right. I think this is a great place for you to compromise because it's not that much to ask of you, Josh, to pronounce it her way. No, I know. And I think that you probably just convinced me that that's the right way. So tell her to translate it as I love you. Every time you say Liz's. (laughs) In That's your own thought, private... Yes. Yeah. Well, he would say Liz. Oh, yeah. I see. If he comes around to her point of view and says it her way, yes. then she needs to hear I love you every time he does that. Exactly. Gotcha. That's, yeah. that's, I, I, I think that's an apt compromise. I think we can do that. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. Well, great. Well, best wishes to both of you. Well, thank you very much, and thanks for taking the call. Okay. Thanks, Josh. Thanks, Josh. Right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yep. Bye. We know you've got opinions about apostrophes for possession after words ending in S. Let us know, 877-929-9673. Email words at waywardradio.org. This eponymous law comes from Herb Locke. He was the cartoonist at the Washington Post back in the day. And it's called Herb Locke's Law. If it's good they'll stop making it. Oh, yes. You know? Yeah. I talked about this on our Facebook group. There was a kind of socks that they made at the Gap like 15 years ago. I loved them. Yeah. They stayed up. The elastic didn't <laughs> overstretch. Up. Right. You know, they were a cotton <laughs> polyester mix. Maybe they, they, You know, they allowed sweating. And then they stopped making them. And I go back and I went back for years to see, oh, do you still have, you'd have any more of those socks? They're like, no, we don't make those. Oh, like, don't you they hate were that? perfect. Don't you I, hate that? And here we are 15 years later and I still haven't found a good replacement for that particular sock. Oh, oh, anyway. I feel your pain, Grant. I, remember Pilot is espresso pens no oh my gosh I was used it to espresso go... or espresso i think it was espresso the, the perfect pen for you it was the perfect pen it felt so good in my hand it moved across the page so sensuously and i used to buy them by the dozen mm. from from you know an office supply store and then they just disappeared and i've looked on ebay i've looked everywhere wow. you know if yeah. anybody has a stash of those i would i would there should be a corollary here we'll call it the barnett barrett corollary which is like it's the worst thing to do is like when they change the formula, like oh. pa- like Pears soap. They just change the formula. I'm like, this is not the Pears soap that I knew. No, That's right. I want the original. This doesn't smell anything like it. So Are we sounding it looks stodgy the same. And crotchety? Oh, get off of my astro turf, sunny boy. <laughs> 877-929-9673 is the number to call to talk with us. Hello, you have a way with words. Hello. Hi, who's this? 
Uh, this is Karen. I'm calling from San Diego. Hi, Karen. Welcome to the show. How can we help you? Thank you. Twice recently, I've heard this phrase, to cut off your nose to spite your face. Um, in both cases, the author in one case, Stephen Pinker, and the uh, podcast host, Stephen Dubner, cited a source for the phrase. Stephen Dubner cited a history by Roger of Wendover, um, which talked about some nuns who were in a abbey who were, they were going to get raided or something, and so they, they wanted to make sure that they weren't, like, sexually assaulted by the people, and so they, the you know, the, the woman who ran the nunnery, the abbess is what they call her, uh, cut off her nose and part, I mean, the way they described it is just horrible. Mm, um, and then all of her sisters did the same thing, and so then they were, you know, saved of at least that fate. Oh, good lord. So, uh, that's but, pretty so, unenlightened. So, really. so the whole idea behind the expression, though, is to go to ridiculous extremes to stop another bad thing from happening when the thing you're going to do is bad enough. Right. Oh, yeah, good point. And, that, and that's what, it's just pointing out kind of this, this terrible action that we would take. We find examples of the same idea, but not the same expression, as far back as 611 in the writings of Publius Cyrus, who was a mimographer. He wrote mimes, which were these exaggerated performances, these comical kind of acts. And he, huh. the, the version that he uses is to burn your neighbor's house down in order to get revenge. Because if you burn your neighbor's house, you're likely to catch your own house on fire, too. <laughs> And we find this also, um, I think it was Henry IV in France, he said <laughs> that um, he would have to burn Paris to save Paris. It's kind of that same idea. Huh. Here's the thing about Stephen Pinker and Stephen Dubner's sources. I've seen the Stephen Pinker passage. I haven't heard the Dubner thing. Um, mm -hmm. There may have been examples of nuns doing that, but cutting off someone's nose is an act of vengeance or even as kind of, a, of an official way of punishing them was fairly common, both in England, Whoa. both in the Europe, in um, Egypt, in Assyria. Ooh. This was a thing that was kind of formalized, particularly for adultery and, and, and certain offenses, particularly if it involved um, a woman who was um, treated as a sexual object, where she was seen as attractive. In order to make her not attractive, they would cut off her nose. Sometimes they would cut off her ears. Sometimes they would cut off her hands or breasts. But yeah. Whoa, that's awful. So, Karen, yeah, there, there may very well be nuns that did what the two Stevens talked about, but there is an older history to the whole concept. Well, cool. Thank you very much. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Thanks for, for calling. calling, Karen. Bye. Call us with your language questions, 877-929-9673, or send them an email to words at waywardradio.org. It's been a couple of years, but do you remember when we talked about what you call the drink that you make at the soda fountain when you take a little bit of everything? Oh, yeah. Suicide, right? Suicide or, or swamp juice. Yeah. Or something. Yeah. A couple of those. All right. So I was reading a story where they interviewed Carrie Elwes. He was in the movie The Princess Bride with Andre the Giant and okay. a bunch of Robin Wright and a bunch of other people, right? Okay. And he plays kind of the hero there. And he was talking about hanging out with Andre the Giant, who was a, who was a massive man mm -hmm. behind the scenes. They'd go out to eat. And apparently Andre the Giant used to drink a drink like that, mixing a little bit of everything, only it was alcohol. And oh, they, my god! And they called it the American, a concoction that consisted of 40 ounces of various liquors poured into a pitcher. Ooh, my, my <laughs> head is hurting just, just listening right. to this. And we also, so I was just remembering all these old calls. We also did the, what was the one where they make it out of the mat you know, at oh, the right. at the at the well, whatever spills in the mat. They right, the pour, bartender's yeah, mat. Yeah, they just pour it yeah. into a glass. Called and, it a Matt Dillon or something. <laughs> yeah, something or, like that. Yeah. Hoy. Anyway, I wanted that to sounds... share that with you. The American. <laughs> I will never have one. Right. Don't ever order an American. But Andre the Giant, R.I.P. You are one of a kind, man. <laughs> <laughs> Give us a call eight seven seven nine two nine nine six seven three. Email words at waywardradio.org. Hello, you have a way with words. Hi, this is Evan from Dallas, Texas. Hi, Evan. Welcome to the program. Hello, Evan. What's going Hi, on? Hi, how you guys doing? All right. Doing well. Yourself? I'm doing great today. Great. Well, how can we help you? Well, I had a question. When I used to write formal letters to relatives and family members, and when receiving them, um, I was told that you use the title master to a male below the age of 8 or 10, and mister for anyone above that age. Hmm. And I was wondering if that is still practiced, or was that correct? And if so, 
is that just something that Southern people, I mean, Southern tradition? No, I wouldn't say it's solely a Southern tradition, and it is a tradition that's fading. The rule I had heard was that uh, you say master up until the age of either eight or 12, Hmm. and then there's nothing between 12 and 18. That's what always confused me. They're not getting any mail at that time. Uh, Yeah, probably not. (laughs) (laughs) And then at 18, you start referring to them as mister. This is pretty standard etiquette, right? Yeah, yeah. It's it's definitely not a regional thing. It doesn't culturally belong to any one particular group. Yeah. So you're a fan of that? Um, It's just something that I remember um, as I get older now and start Mm -hmm. writing, you know, thank you cards and and more, you know, letters because nowadays most people just write emails. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm starting to have nieces and nephews, and I was just wondering if that's something that's proper or if that's fading. It's certainly proper. It's proper. It's a yeah. little formal in these yeah. informal times. My mother does it when she sends letters to oh, my, my son, who is seven. Uh-huh. Yeah, Master Guthrie Barrett, and he feels a little flattered by it because yeah. he feels like it's a title. And what does that title mean, Master? Because I'm sure most people don't have aren't masters anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a variant of Mr. And I believe Mr. goes back to um, to, uh, the whole idea of masters in guilds, in medieval guilds. Mm -hmm. Related to like the Spanish word maestro, meaning teacher, right? Yeah, maestro. Maestro, yeah. Or or Italian like that. Yeah, but going back to Latin then originally. Okay, wow. Thank you, guys. Well, thanks for calling. Thanks for calling, Evan. No problem. Thank you for answering that. You have a great day. Sure thing. Bye-bye. This is a show about language and how we use it. We'll take your questions on any subject, 877-929-9673. Email words at waywardradio.org. talking earlier about eponymous laws. Here's one I really like. Do you know Betteridge's Law of Headlines? Yes. If it asks a question, the answer is probably no. Yes. <laughs> Any headline which ends in a question mark can be answered by the word no. no. Did aliens actually abduct the president and replace him with a clone? No. <laughs> yeah. Is coffee bad for you? No. Right, because it, it, it plays on this the thing they do in news, which is in order to get you to read the story, they suggest something preposterous and then say, at the very bottom say, uh, no, actually, the answer is no. <laughs> Let us know your favorite eponymous law, 877-929-9673, or make up your own and send it to words at waywardradio.org. What's the word you savor the most? You can tell us. More from Away With Words in just a minute. Got a minute? We need your help. Head over to gum.fm slash words and share your thoughts in our quick survey. Your feedback matters. It's the backbone of our show's success. Thanks for making our show even more successful. That's G-U-M dot F-M slash W-O-R-D-S. Thank you. You're listening to Away With Words, the show about language and how we use it. I'm Grant Barrett. And I'm Martha Barnett. We had a discussion on the show recently about the language of grief and death. And listeners have been continuing that conversation online and in email, particularly about two phrases, one of which is, I'm sorry for your loss, and the other one being, pass away, as opposed to die. We heard from Catherine S. Quinn, a psychologist in Del Mar, California. She's not only counseled grieving people, but her own son died suddenly at the age of 24. And she said that using the word loss in that case kind of minimizes the loss itself. She writes, The word death is commonly used interchangeably with the word loss, including by those of us who are professionals, who sometimes skirt around the intensity of the utterance. Still, the word death is most realistic, and when used with sensitivity and compassion when a death has happened, it feels the most accurate for our loved ones and in understanding their experience of this significant event. And she says that um, 
rather than get hung up on the language, sometimes you just have to give a hug, mm-hmm. just say, I'm so sorry, recognize the fact that you really don't know how that person mm-hmm. is feeling. Uh, and we heard an echo of that idea in a note that we got from Nicholas Clifford. He's a professor emeritus of history at Middlebury College in Vermont, and he wrote, It's all very well to be against euphemisms. I'm very much so. But unfortunately, you've got to be respectful of other people's feelings. At the age of 84, I'm living in a retirement place. And here, when the Grim Reaper pays a call, words like passed on or simply passed are used. And I don't think I'm in a position to tell others what language they should employ, even when their own makes me cringe. And he continues, as far as I'm concerned, I've told my children, four daughters, that when I die, I really do die. I don't pass or pass on or transition or metamorphose or anything (laughs) like that. If my children and those they deal with are unable to use words like die and death, they have my permission instead to say, he left in search of better job opportunities. (laughs) 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 That at least should bring a chuckle and a return to reality. (laughs) What was his name again? (laughs) Nicholas Clifford. Nicholas, thank you very much for the laugh there, because it's a serious subject, and yet this is the path that we'll all take. Exactly. We still welcome your thoughts on the language of death and dying. Give us a call, 877-929-9673, or email us, words at waywardradio.org. Hello, you have a way with words. Hello, this is Thane from Bridger Valley, Wyoming. Hi, Thane. Welcome to the show. Oh, thank you. What can we do for you? I have a little bit of a story and then a question. Great. Um, I grew up on a horse ranch here in southwestern Wyoming. And we always were taught that we have to feed the animals before we feed ourselves. Mm -hmm. Um, But the problem was Christmas morning. As kids, we wanted to get up and open all the presents, and so it was really hard to either go out and do chores or wait for Dad to finish the chores. Mm -hmm. So my mother made a kind of German pancake. It took about a half hour to make, and it included the blender and... uh, we would eat that with syrup on Christmas morning, and she called it Hoot Nanny. Mm-hmm. Uh, she got the, both the recipe and the name from her mother, who is a Dutch Irish uh, homesteader out here. And um, I thought it was Hoot Nanny until I went to it was, until I went to college in New York City, and everyone says Hoot Nanny. That's a party in Appalachia. Mm-hmm. Um, so I guess my question is twofold. Is that original for here? Is my family the only one that uses hoot nanny for a German pancake? Where does the phrase hoot nanny come from, meaning a party? And for that matter, why is a hoot a good time? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, it's well, not called a hum nanny, right? you got to holler. That's right. right. It's out not a ho hum nanny. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Now, you said yeah. a German pancake. What do you mean well, by it's that? Like, it's like German. the recipe for German pancakes. You take six eggs, some flour, and some, and you put a whole bunch of butter, which is mm-hmm. not normal in German pancakes, and you bake it for 30 minutes, and um, it fluffs up really big, and then you almost like an egg casserole, and then you eat it with syrup. Mm. Okay. For, mm. Mm-hmm. Okay, this is really good. Now, you're not alone. There are other recipes for Hootenanny pancakes out there. Um, you can do a search on Google Books, and you'll find at least four recipes for Hootenanny pancakes. What's interesting is that they're not all pancakes. Like you say, some of them are casserole dishes. You put a lot of butter. It's basically the same as a pancake recipe with a lot of butter and a lot of eggs. Like all of the recipes call for six eggs, which as far as I'm concerned is a lot of eggs for, That's for, very for pancakes. Eggy. yeah. I was going to say, it sounds like a big production. Is that, is that why it's called a hootenanny? Well, there's a really interesting thing about the word hootenanny. Uh, Thane, it hasn't always just been these pancakes, which is pretty rare usage, nor the big party that you would have in Appalachia. It has meant just a thingamajig. It has been like a, a kind of placeholder word for a lot of different things. And um, I think it's kind of just been borrowed here and there, like you might borrow doohickey or thingamajig. Uh, just to refer to a thing that doesn't have a name, right? 
So、oh. in the Dictionary of American Regional English, they talk about it as a kind of sleigh. They talk about a something to、uh, sharpen shears. They talk about it as、um, an imaginary object, certain other kinds of tools, something insignificant or nonsense,、um, and the party. So hoot nanny has been a lot of different things, and we'll find that again and again throughout、uh, the slangy words of English, where a word will take a, quite a while. To fix its meaning, and when it does get fixed, sometimes it's used for more than one thing. And this is here we are. It's pancakes, or it's a party, and、I、or bet- both. Pancakes at a party. Yeah, I was gonna say. <laughs> thanks, <laughs> thanks, thanks, thanks so much for giving us a call. <laughs> thanks for no calling. No problem. Thank you. Take、All、care. Right. Bye bye. Bye bye. Eight seven seven nine two nine nine six seven three. Seagulls Law, S E G A L. Seagulls.、Uh, don't think so. You might recognize it. It goes: a man with a watch knows what time it is. A man with two watches is never sure. Ah, nice. That I can really relate to that. You that, know, you、yeah. look something up, and then you look in another source, and it's a little bit、right. different. Who's、yeah. the right source? Right, and then you call、right? your favorite radio show and yeah. look them. <laughs> and then they do the、you. same thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Like wow. That's right. Sometimes TMI is just TMI, right? Hmm. <laughs> What's your favorite eponymous law? Make one up for yourself. Eight seven seven nine two nine nine six seven three, or email words at waywardradio.org. Hello, you have a way with words. Hello. Hi, who's this?、Uh, this is Jeremy from Milton, Florida. Hey, Jeremy. Welcome to the show. How can we help?、Uh, well, I、uh, had a question about two words. Let's say that you are going to go on a trip, and you would normally say, "I went there by plane or by car,、mm-hmm. or I flew on a plane, on a train." But you wouldn't say on a car. You would say in a car.、Mm-hmm. Yeah. Why is there a distinction between the in a car but not in a plane, or you wouldn't say on a car? I have a general guideline, a general rule for why we do this. Do you want to hear it? And it's、sure. about feelings. We all just kind of notice that we feel that on a train is correct, but、mm-hmm. in a car is correct. It's it's a native speaker's、yeah. intuition that、mm-hmm. we're working with here, and it has to do about whether or not we feel like we're being enclosed. Or whether that we feel like we're standing or sitting on a platform or a floor, or some kind of long, long surface that contains other people or contains other things, and we can、right. work down all the different kinds of transportation from small to large and start to notice that there's a pretty good consistency there about whether that we feel enclosed or whether that we feel like we're on a platform or floor or, or some other kind of surface. For example,、uh, bicycles and motorcycles, scooters were on them, skateboards were on them,、mm-hmm. right? We're not、right. in them because there's no enclosure whosoever.、Mm-hmm. We're on a sled. Yeah, we're on a sled. But you're in cars because the enclosure is the salient feature. That's the thing、right. about a car. And also, when you're in a car, you're kind of like fixed in your seat, maybe even seat belted in, and you, there's not this freedom to move about back and forth across the space、mm-hmm. like you would you、right. have on a train, on a ship, on a plane. Trains are really interesting because I can be on a train, but I'm in the sleeper car. Right. Or I'm in my cabin,、right. or I'm in the caboose,、mm-hmm. but I'm on the train because I don't feel quite as enclosed as I do in these smaller spaces, and I feel the freedom to move about, to move back and forth. Yeah, I'm thinking historically、right. too. The precursors of cars. I mean, you might say my ancestors came to California in a Cal- Conestoga wagon. Yeah,、right? or they, or if, but if you, if, but if you say that they came on a wagon, you might imagine there was no covering and there、yep. was no enclosure, right? right? Yeah. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't start thinking about that until this.、Uh, So years ago, I was teaching English in Japan, and I would, you know, you never think about the language as much as when you're trying to teach it to somebody. Oh, absolutely! And they're asking you all these questions, and that just happened to be one of the numerous questions that kind of threw me for a loop for a second. I was like,、uh, I don't know, why do we say that way?、Mm-hmm. <laughs> Let me ask you about a, a, another class of things, vessels that、um, go on the water. So you would be on a raft, right? Right. But for a canoe, a dinghy, or a kayak, what would you be?、Uh, yeah, I guess you'd be in a in a canoe because you're somewhat enclosed, I、yeah. guess. And or not, you'd be upon a sit upon. Yeah, and there's not, but there's not the、sit、freedom upon, to、yeah. there's not the freedom to move about. That's the thing. Once you're on,、oh, right, once the vessel and you are become a unit, you're not free to move about.、Hmm. Um, let me ask you about a yacht. Are you in a yacht or on a yacht?、Hmm. Does yeah, it matter if you're、uh, below decks? Yeah, if you're below deck, I guess you would be 
Well, I, I, actually, I would always say on a yacht. I think I would, like too. Like you said, if you've had the freedom of movement, you can move around. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah, so it's pretty interesting. So do you feel the freedom to move about upon some kind of platform, and do you feel enclosed? Again, feelings. At the bottom of language, a lot of times, is this relationship to the, the connotations of the experience and not necessarily about a perfect logic. Right. Okay. Well, that would have been a good well, answer for those students in Japan. That, that was a <laughs> spectacular answer. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Jeremy. Take care now. You too. Bye-bye. 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 Well, tell us your stories about language. The number is 877-929-9673, or you can send them an email to words at waywardradio.org. And you know what? We are all over Facebook and Twitter. Grant, you know I'm a big hiker. I've mm-hmm. really fallen in love with hiking since I moved to San Diego. And just uh, give me a camelback and, and poles and I am off, nice. right? yeah. And so I was delighted to find this uh, term in Japanese, shinrin-yoku. Shinrin-yoku. Why is that familiar to me? Um, I think because maybe you saw it on my Facebook page. Oh, I was, maybe, yeah. I was really excited when I discovered it. It literally means forest bath. For, if that's what you're doing. Yeah, oh. yeah. And I think specifically in Japanese, it may refer to a more contemplative kind of walking and, and taking in all the sensations than I actually do. But I love that that notion of a forest bath, you know, just sort of exfoliating all the stress yeah, from that's uh, everyday feels. life, right? It reminds me of something in British English, which we don't quite use in American English. We think of hiking and hikers here, but in there they think of rambling and ramblers. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's a little just far more common there than it is yeah. here. And I love the notion that hiking sounds personal and rambling sounds, well, I'm just going to leave the house and let's see what happens. Mm-hmm. Kind of browsing. Mm-hmm. Which browsing nature, goes browsing the to, world. Yeah, 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 which literally goes back to the action of cows going ah, from nice. one, one thing to the other. 877-929-9673 is the number to call or find us on Facebook and Twitter. Hello, you have a way with words. Hi. Um, this is uh, Melanie from Reno, Nevada. Hey, Melanie. Welcome to the show from Reno, Nevada. How can we help you? Um, I have a question about the word derp. derp? Uh, my child and the neighborhood kids have been running around saying this word constantly. Uh, I've looked it up, um, tried to figure out what it, what it is and what it means. I have a pretty good idea, but when I ask them... What it means, they say, oh, it's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes, it must be. So uh, <laughs> I felt that I had to go to the experts. <laughs> Sounds like they're the experts. Seriously. So, so how do they use the word derp, and how are you spelling it? Well, I, I would have spelled it D-U-R-P, but mm-hmm. apparently they spell it D-E-R-P. I mean, okay. that's, the, that's the spelling that I found online. Okay. Mm-hmm. So the way they use it is sort of as commentary, but there's many variations. So if somebody does something that you might consider a fail or is um, not exactly stupid, I mean, it has a different meaning, like if they slip and fall, for example, or they mess up somehow, they'll just go derp or derpy derp derp. (laughs) <laughs> uh, or snurp a derp. Snurp a derp. Uh, that would be the really tragic fail. Uh, so, and my daughter has used it with me, which was surprising. Um, hey, mom, you just derped away. And what does that mean? <laughs> well, that means apparently that I'm not. I just kind of. She said something to me, and I just spaced out and and turned away as if I wasn't paying attention. So not paying attention has something to do with this. Mm -hmm. Sounds like uh, lots of awkwardness involved with being derpy. Derped away. I looked at this word derp in 2011, and when somebody had suggested to me that it came from the movie Basketball, which was made by Trey Parker and Matt Stone, the creators of the uh, South Park, Park, yeah. yeah. 
I uh-huh. was like, yeah, right. And you turn the movie on, and it's like within the first couple minutes of the show, these two dudes are doing something really embarrassing. They're going through a woman's underwear drawer, and then when she chases them out of the room, for some reason, as the scene cuts to another scene, you hear derp, like kind of <laughs> a non sequitur. And I'm like, what? I, I don't get it. Maybe one of the, I couldn't tell if the actors were saying because you couldn't see their faces really. But uh-huh. Know Your Meme has done a pretty good job of tracking down every time that Derp has been used in South Park episodes, the show created by the same guys who created the movie Basketball. Uh-huh. And so I would speculate that these two men, if they're not the originators of the term, are very definitely the popularizers of Derp. And it has been pervasive ever since. Um, on Reddit, people use it like crazy. It's involved with a wide variety of memes and different characters. Um uh, you see it now popping up in slangy descriptions of other people and yourself. It's it's thoroughly enmeshed into English, American English slang at this point. So, Melanie, I guess my question would be: Are you allowed to use it, or do your kids, <laughs> does your kid roll her eyes when you say it? I, I'm certainly allowed to use it. Oh, you are. And, okay. Yeah. It's and, not uh, derpy of you not to to no. use it. Okay. It's not derpy. Okay. I got to say, Melanie, this was a great question. We know we have a lot of parents and grandparents out there who probably have never heard this term, and their kids and grandkids are all like, well, of course, yeah. Duh. We totally use that. Durr. Durr. <laughs> Doy. Thanks for calling today. Thanks, Thanks, Melanie. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Sure, take care it. now. It's very informative. Bye-bye. Bye to your Bye-bye. daughter. Bye-bye. 877-929-9673. Email words at waywardradio.org. Things have come to a pretty pass. That's all for today's broadcast, but don't wait till next week to chat with us. Find us on Facebook, Twitter, iTunes, or SoundCloud. Check out our website, too, at waywardradio.org, where you'll find a dictionary, a newsletter, mobile apps, and a discussion forum. And you can listen to hundreds of past episodes for free. You can also leave us a message anytime, day or night, at 877-929-9673. Share your family's stories about language, or ask us to resolve language disputes at work, home, or in school. You can also email us. That address is words at waywardradio.org. Our senior producer is Stephanie Levine. The show is directed and edited this week by Tim Felton. We have production help from James Ramsey and Tamar Wittenberg. Away With Words is independently produced and distributed by Wayward, Inc., a nonprofit supported by listeners and organizations who believe in lifelong learning and better human communication. The show is coming to you from the Recording Arts Center at Studio West in San Diego, California. Thanks for listening. I'm Martha Barnett. And I'm Grant Barrett. Bye-bye. So long. I like tomato, potato, potato, tomato, tomato. Let's call the whole 